welcome everyone. My name is Maya Hargens. I'm a career counselor at UC Santa Barbara and I work closely with students who are interested in careers in law and government. And I feel like we are so lucky to have here with us Scott Kessler. I've been working with Scott for maybe the last six months or so really picking his brain and sending lots of students to him who are interested in careers in national security. So we are lucky to hear from you live and you are welcome to ask questions. I have a list of questions also, um, so I'll be managing the Q&A. But Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you love about national security. That was very generous, Maya. Thank you very much. So as Maya said, my name is Scott Kessler. I am a retired CIA operations officer. Um, I spent, I started with the CIA. Um, I was recruited as a graduate student in 1987. Um, I think the thing that piqued the agency's interest in me is that I could speak Arabic, not very well, but I had a little bit of Arabic that I had uh, acquired after uh, college and during college a little bit. I got into the agency, into a graduate uh, program, and I spent 24 years as an operations officer. I'm a Middle East specialist, so I'm a Arabic speaker and a Farsi speaker. I'm really an Iran specialist, but I worked Arab Target as well. So I sort of had two careers. I had the pre-9-11 career. 9-11 happened about mid-career for me. I had a couple of uh, traditional overseas tours. My, my whole career really was overseas. I worked in uh, Dubai and in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Then I went to Nicosia, Cyprus. I spent a lot of time in Syria uh, from Cyprus. 9-11 happened. I immediately went to northern Pakistan. And then I led a team into uh, southern Iraq in 2003 as part of the uh, invasion force supporting the Marine Corps. Uh, set up a base in uh, southern Iraq. I did a traditional tour in Vienna, Austria. I uh, did some work domestically on counterterrorism, and then my last assignment was in Lashkargah, Afghanistan. I was the agency uh, chief supervising agency support to the Marine Corps, um, uh, plus up of 25,000 Marines in 2010, which, uh, I don't know, it all seems like we probably could have had a sandwich and a Diet Coke when you look at what's going on now. but. Uh, uh, and I retired after that. I started Spartan Compass about five years ago, and uh, the goal was just to provide uh, what I hope I'm going to do successfully in the next few minutes, which is to provide uh, gu guidance and uh, advising to people who are interested in jobs in U.S. national security. Um, so, uh, Maya, what do you want to do? Do you want me to? I have a question. Are there questions for you. you want me to? Yeah, fire away. I want to know why Spartan Compass? Why did you create it? Uh, so I, I, I have to, that's all right. So I'll just be frank. I, I was a little bit disillusioned uh, around 2016 with the division and uh, anger in the country. And uh, I can do what a lot of people do, which is rail on Twitter or uh, argue with their high school classmates or whatever, because that didn't seem particularly productive. And so I thought, so what can I do in some small way? What what does my experience allow me to do to contribute to something that is not that, that is not partisan, that's not involved in the rancorous, angry um, debates? And I came up with this idea of um, trying to help people who, who want to get involved in uh, government service and providing for the security of the country not sh should not really be a should not really be part of the political debates what the agency does or what the FBI does or what the Justice Department does those can be political questions but the idea of serving the nation hopefully is less controversial but anyway that's uh, that's where it came from Just looking looking for a way to engage and use my experience in, in a productive way to help uh, the lengthy process of healing the rifts in the country. Wow, I don't know what to ask on top of that. Um, I do wanna ask, and so I'm going off script a little bit. You work with college students a lot. What do you enjoy about working with college students? you know, what makes you excited to talk to UCSB students and talk with me and share your story? 
So about half of the clients that we serve are uh, college or university uh, undergrad and graduate students, and about half, maybe a little bit more, are transitioning U.S. military personnel who are interested in, uh, if they're enlisted, going back to school uh, to get a college degree and, and then uh, going back into national security. Um, so that career that I had, that was just the greatest thing imaginable. Um, it was awesome. Even the crappy parts, like even the year in Iraq and combat and the combat tour in Afghanistan, they certainly were not fun, but I felt good about uh, doing them. I worked with some of the finest people I've ever met in my life. It's uh, the culture of CIA is uh, something that I really enjoyed. Um, it was a uh, an important time for national security throughout most of my career and especially in the region that I worked in. And so the idea of being able to help people answer questions, provide encouragement, provide guidance to people who are interested in a career like this is, is enjoyable to me. I'm mostly engaging with people who share an interest or at least they think they share an interest in that kind of a career. And quite honestly, it's just a resource that wasn't available to me. I wasn't, I didn't know anybody who worked in national security. The internet didn't really exist uh, when I was a college. Well, the internet did not exist. The World Wide Web did not exist when I was a college student. And uh, you couldn't just look up CIA people in the phone book and talk to them. It would have been nice to get some questions answered. And so I enjoyed doing that. Usually the, the feedback that we get is pretty positive. What? does national security mean? What are careers in national security? So uh, speaking about the CIA, I, you know, the intelligence community is a huge thing. So I'll focus most of my comments on the CIA because that's what I'm the most familiar with. Though I can try to respond to questions about other agencies, especially if we have representatives from those agencies and spark compass like the FBI uh, or DEA. Uh, 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 but I'll, I'll focus my comments on the agency. So the agency is an external security apparatus intelligence organization. CIA is responsible for gathering information to answer questions that national security, uh, the national security apparatus, the White House, the president, the national security staff, uh, the Pentagon senior staff, State Department senior staff, answering questions that they have to help inform their decisions. CIA tends to focus on uh, you have open source information, you have diplomatic correspondence, so that State Department people going out and talking to people in the countries that they're, that they're living in where they're representing the United States. You have academic resources, and then you have questions that cannot be answered th through any of those avenues, right? Iranian, uh, the Iranian, the state of the Iranian nuclear program, uh, Chinese military plans and intentions, the function of the Russian intelligence apparatus. Can't find that on the internet. Uh, a State Department person is not gonna be able to gather that information and an academic is not gonna be able to do research to collect on those topics. CIA answers those questions. Primarily what the agency does is uh, collection through human intelligence methods. So that's finding people that have access to that information and recruiting them to spy for the United States. Some of what CIA does is to support NSA's mission, uh, the National Security Agency, which is uh, signals uh, intelligence. So that's tapping electronic communications, satellite communications, internet communications, telephone communications. So CIA supports that, but that's NSA's mission. That is a very important source of um, uh, foreign intelligence information. The CIA takes, there are analysts in the agency that take all source information, and classified intelligence information, and they put it into finished intel form. So those are written reports that go to the White House, the Pentagon, and State Department, and the National Security staff. So you mentioned I was I was not an analyst. I was an operations officer. So I was the person in overseas trying to recruit agents and handling agents and write, writing the raw foreign intelligence. Okay. So CIA is an agency, FBI. DEA, NSA, there's, there's quite a few of them. What are the right. kind of general differences between them? And is there a, a agencies that are more friendly to hiring recent college graduates? 
FBI is the FBI is not an intelligence. It's part of the national security apparatus because it has a counter espionage mission inside the United States. So it's to catch foreign. It's to catch people who are doing what the agency is doing to other countries abroad. It's it's to catch services that are trying to do that inside the United States. Got it. Primarily, the FBI is a law enforcement organization. It, we we don't have an internal security apparatus. Uh, the British, for example, they have MI6, SIS, which is the equivalent of CIA. They have MI5, which is their internal, it's an intelligence service. Israel has Mossad, which is an external uh, security agency and intelligence organization like CIA. And they have Shin Bet or Shabak, which is a internal. We don't have, we, we just we don't have an internal intelligence service. Uh, some people uh, are of the opinion that we should have one. We don't have one. That differentiates the FBI from the other organizations. NSA is uh, military. About half of the people at NSA are military and half are civilian, and they do signals intelligence collection. Um, there are uh, 16 or 17 agencies uh, in, in, the, in the intelligence community, um, and those are the three biggest. Oh, uh, college students. So CIA and FBI in general like people to have a little bit of professional or and or life experience outside of or after college. It's not unheard of to get hired um, right out of college. It happens. It usually it, the FBI hires accountants, I think, right out of college, but everybody else, they like them to be have three to five years of experience. With the agency, if uh, if you have a physics degree and you can speak Russian or Chinese, they take a real hard look at you, even if you're only 22. But in general, they want you to get some uh, life experience, so that can be more more study, language study, travel, um, it, it, anything that'll help you uh, learn a little bit more about the world. International travel is good. And the biggest differentiator is learning a critical national security foreign language. So that's Arabic, Persian, or Farsi, uh, Russian, um, Chinese, Korean, but it's only one, one country, Korean, but it's an important language as well. Okay. So FBI, CIA, probably not right away unless you have some really amazing, amazing skills that they want or an account. If you get an undergraduate, you can apply for an undergraduate internship. If you get an internship, that'll come with a top secret clearance, which you have to have to work in any of these agencies just to get onto the computer systems or get into the facilities. Um, and so if you can, if you, if you apply for and are awarded an undergraduate internship, um, uh, the, you, they give you a, they usually offer you the job because you're cleared. Uh, that's one way, but uh, grad school, the military, uh, teaching English in China, I don't know, there are a lot of avenues. So, so me, I, uh, I learned, I went to the Middle East for two years after college and I learned Hebrew and Arabic. And that really, in, the, in, you know, in hindsight, that was the differentiator that got me into the agency. I applied a couple of times and I didn't get in and then I was recruited a couple of years later. So you were on their radar, but then once you learned those languages, it was more, you were more appealing to them. I think I was not on their radar. I think I wanted to be on their radar. And, uh, In the good and way. That put, and, that, and that put me on their radar, yeah. Um, I think students are very interested in hearing about the security clearance process. So we want to hear an overview and how it may, is it always top, top secret? Um, yeah, so they're, they're clear. Yeah, there are different levels of security clearances, but I, I'll just talk about the top secret clearance, the requirements for a top secret clearance, which is what I had when I worked in the government. To, to, to get into any of these agencies, you have to have a TSSCI, right? Uh, compartmented uh, access, um, which requires a SCI means that you need to do a lifestyle polygraph. So you, you fill out a bunch of paperwork, including an SF-86. You can just Google it. SF-86, uh, Security Form 86, it's a long form, and it just asks everything. Where have you lived? Where did you study? you ever been fired from a job? Um, have you ever undergone psychological counseling or psychiatric care? Um, 
drug use, illegal activity, uh, financial problems like bankruptcy or garnishing of wages, non-payment of taxes, every imaginable thing they'll ask you. You'll, you'll have an interview about that. And then uh, let's get your foreign travel and your foreign contacts, foreign meaning not non-US, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then eventually you'll have a, a polygraph, which is a security and counterintelligence interview hooked up to a polygraph. So uh, I would characterize that as a, not a particularly enjoyable um, experience, but that's the method that the US uses. Um, Israelis use graphology or handwriting analysis, which seems like witchcraft to me, but I suspect the polygraph seems like witchcraft to them. Anyway, I've been through that. You have to take it every five years. I've been through that, you know, whatever 36 divided by five is, but right, like a lot of times, right? Um, it, it's fine. I mean, the key is be very uh, accurate with what you write on those forms. And be extremely straightforward with what you tell. I had a, uh, so if it says to you, have you used marijuana or any other illegal, illegal under federal law, it's le legal in California, but it's not legal yet under federal law. Have you used any illegal drug in the last seven years? And let's say that you used marijuana uh, six years and 10 months ago. So you just write no. Well, they're going to ask you about that when you fill out the form. Was everything you wrote in the form accurate? They're going to polygraph you, and you're probably going to have a reaction on the polygraph because you lied. And then you will never get a clearance, not because you used cannabis six and a half years before you filled out the form, but because you lied on a federal form and you lied to a federal officer, which is an integrity issue. So integrity is a, is, a, is a big deal. So just be very straightforward. So I see a lot of resumes doing this, you know, and uh, the resumes, you know, they, they, they do a lot of uh, shading uh, someone's experience to put your best foot forward, which is fine. People who read resumes all the time know that people do that. It's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, humble bragging or bragging or a appropriate on a resume, right? Because you're competing with other, you're using it, the document to compete with other people. That's all fine, but you don't do that on those forms. Just answer the questions as they ask. If you have, uh, if you're convicted of a felony um, or um, you have a lot of drug use or you did something like uh, sell hard drugs, um, you're going to have a hard time getting a clearance. It's not to say you're not going to get a clearance, but those things make it more difficult to get a clearance. Um, the steps in the clearance, you'll, you'll then have an interview. There's a psychological interview. You have to take a physical. And right now, it's taken about a year to get through the clearance process. It was worse. And they're sort of catching up from what I understand. I don't, I don't work there anymore, but I have contacts there. And so from what I understand, they're almost back to normal now. When with, does the uh, security clearance COVID. process start? Do you get hired and then go through it? And then what do you do for that year while you're waiting? Yeah, so if you apply and they, they, they contact you, uh, they'll talk. Usually they'll do it like a phone interview. And uh, then the next step is they'll send you or they'll direct you to the paperwork for the clearance process. You fill all that out and submit it. That starts the process. They look at that stuff. Uh, they'll go through a couple of interviews. They'll uh, they may come out and see somebody. They may invite them back to the East Coast for an interview. And it, polygraphs will generally take place in in Northern Virginia, where the where the CIA is located. Um, that's all before anything happens. If you go through the clearance process, you're adjudicated and you're awarded a clearance. You're usually going to get a job offer at that point, but there's, it's, a, it's an at-will process. They can terminate the process at any point for any reason, and they may or may not tell you why. They may or may not tell you it's terminated. I mean, there are, it's a little bit more human uh, now than it was 25 years ago. They would just drop you and you would never hear from them again. Um, now they treat people more like a normal employer would. So you're not you're not you're not hired until after you're cleared. And if you don't clear, you're not going to get a job offer. 
You mentioned a couple things that you fill out in the process on the paperwork about drugs and crime and traveling and even like therapeutic things. So if someone has experienced, let's say a lot of college students experience anxiety and depression and have been to therapy, including therapy on campus, and they mention that on their paperwork, is that a bad thing? I mean, they want to be honest, but how is that going to No, it's not a bit. No, it's not a bad thing. I, I, I was in combat for two years. I may have had some therapy myself. You know, not, you know, not to overshare, but. Oh, me too. So no, that's not that's not a problem. Uh, a, a problem is uh, uh, on 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 any kind of unregulated diagnosable problem. It it could be anxiety disorder. It could be type one diabetes. You just you just everything needs to be. Uh, you need to be in tip top shape and in control of your faculties to when you get a clearance, it means the government trusts you to protect classified information. And uh, you need to be at the top of your game to do that. And so, no, they'll just want to make sure you're if you're supposed to take medication, you're taking the medication. Um, if you're supposed to see a therapist, you're seeing a therapist. If you're supposed to keep your A1C level at a certain level, you're keeping it there. Um, that's all. So the answer, the answer to that question is no, you shouldn't not, you should tell the truth about it and it's not going to compromise your ability to get a clearance. Can we talk a little bit more about drugs? I know that, um, different, uh, agencies have different rules about different drugs and how long it's been. And I know that things are becoming a little bit more, um, <laughs> open about marijuana and harder drugs five years versus 10 years or 10 months or one year? Like, do you have some more information about that to kind of ease some? Yes. Yeah, so, so in general, they're going to ask you about your drug use going back seven years. That's what they're going to ask you at, at present. That's what they're asking people. And right now, anything that's illegal everywhere, uh, methamphetamine and cocaine and things like that, that's, that's that's going to be a complicating factor uh, if you have it in within seven years. If it's if it's one use, three years before or two years before, and no subsequent use, and you never sold it, and you you know that's possible. Cannabis is a one year waiting period. My kids tell me I'm not supposed to call it cannabis because I sound like a narc. But anyway, ma marijuana, uh, it's a one year. Right now, it's a one year waiting period. But because the clearance process takes so long, um, if you're thinking about applying for one of these jobs, I would say just like cut it off now, right? And uh, by the time you apply, you'll be able to say, uh, yeah, well, I used it in college. And um, I, I tried it in college. And, 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 they were, I, I, and it was kind of a nice edge for me. It was like one, one time. But that was 1987. That wouldn't be an issue now. Um, but I had tried it one time, like five years before. So, so I would say, if you're thinking about applying for one of these jobs, just uh, uh, stop stop using it until it becomes legal at, in, uh, under federal law, and then it won't be an issue. It'll be like alcohol; it won't be an issue anymore. We've had a couple questions come through. I think you kind of said that you're not going to talk about the other levels of clearance because they don't really matter in the sense of national security careers. You always need to have top to stop security. Yeah. I mean, the military has a lot of people that are cleared secret. Um, it's much easier. Uh, it, 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 it's much easier to get a lot more people have it, but it doesn't really impinge. It doesn't Im impact your ability to get hired into uh, one of the organs, national security organs, because nobody there has a secret clearance. Um, this is a great question. How has the background check evolved over time? For example, are they looking at social media? Yeah, they do look at social media. They'll ask you about it. They may ask to look at it. I don't have anything. I'm just on LinkedIn, is it? So, uh, 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 not because of that. I mean, I'm retired. But they will look at that. So, just be cognizant of what you're posting. Um, so, if you... I've seen, I'm only saying this because I've seen it. Um, like if you if you have a if there's a video or a picture of you using illegal drug and it's on your Instagram feed from high school, you, you might want to yeah you might want to clean that up. It's not going to help you. I don't know that it would kill you, but they'll look at that. 
So what they're not particularly interested in is the content of your posts. Unless you're unless you're advocating terrorism or a support for a terrorist organization or uh, support for an organization that looks to do harm to the United States, I, I would strongly advise not to do that. And if you do feel that way, it's totally fine. But the national security apparatus might not be the best place for you to work. You might might want to work somewhere else. Um, so yeah, they're not really so interested in the content. Like you're, you you support Trump or you support Biden or uh, I don't think anybody cares about that. They, they were both elected presidents of the United States, so. I don't think the agency is going to, they're not going to look at anything like that in the clearance process. No one cares. But yeah, keep your nose clean is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, As, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially don't do anything illegal. Especially if something contradicts what you're writing on your paperwork. That's a big no-no. Yeah, don't lie. Don't lie on the paperwork. And and what I mean when I say lie is nothing, no inconsistencies. You're going to be asked about the stuff you write on those forms over and over and over again. And they're asking you, not because they don't know the answer. They've read the forms. They're looking for the consistency of your answers over time, and they should be consistent. It's not a memory test, but it is uh, an integrity test. Will there be a situation in the process where they contact people that you know? Yeah, they'll ask you for references to verify where you live, where you work, who your friends are. And they will call those people. Um, depending on how you're hired, uh, that might be a commercial process. So the person might not say they're calling from the government. They might say that uh, this person has applied for a job with the company and I'm doing a character assessment of them. I, it just depends on how you're hired. If you're hired as an overt employee or a co like I was undercover my whole career. So they wouldn't, with me, they, oh. the, at the time, the, 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 the guys went and they came to, the school I was studying, the University of Texas at Austin, and they they said they were from the department, the Defense Department, um, which isn't. So they uh, uh, that's become a little bit more sophisticated now. They literally showed up like in trench coats, saying that they were from this Defense Department. It was ridiculous. Anyway, so so uh, that, that's evolved a little bit over time. That's a little bit more sophisticated, but they will call your references, and they're they're mostly just asking, you know, what is she like. Uh, uh, would you trust this person? Uh, uh, what's your experience been? Just general questions like that. Um, some more questions about college students kind of entering any of these fields. Um, what are some things that students can do while they're college students to help prepare them to be competitive in a national security career? Learn a foreign language is the, is the, is the easiest. It's not easy. But it's the easiest, most accessible one. Even if you just put Chinese Duolingo on your phone and you do 15 minutes a day and you, and you can then say truthfully, I have beginner Chinese. That is a huge differentiator. Not just, not because they're going to send you to Beijing, but it, because you've shown an interest in, 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 in doing something challenging to make yourself more competitive. So. Chinese, Arabic, Persian, uh, Russian, um, any of those, recommend one of those. You could study anything, but Chinese is a lot more valuable. It will make you much more competitive than German or Spanish or French. Uh, although French is a pretty good one because they speak it all over Africa and there's a lot of targets in Africa. So uh, foreign, foreign language is, is, is one. It doesn't really matter what you study. Um, STEM fields are very sought after. So computer engineering, physics, uh, theoretical mathematics, because see, uh, NSA hires a lot of people to train them to be cryptographers. Um, if you have, uh, if your, if your, uh, if your computer skills are good, so computer science, computer engineering, NSA and CIA hire a lot of people like that. The FBI hires a lot of people like that. Those degrees are great. Um, if you marry that up with a language, it'd be, you, I mean, you, 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 they'll call you if you. If you have a if you have a comp sci degree or a computer engineering degree and you can speak Arabic or Chinese, they're going to call you. Although I realize that's like two short lifetimes of worth of work, but I'm just saying some people already have those languages natively, right? So that makes them competitive if they're American citizens. Um, the military is a is a good pathway if you're interested. Don't, 
don't go to the military to try to get into the FBI. But if you're interested in that, the military is a good pathway. Grad school is a good pathway. And then international careers that involve uh, a little bit of travel. And it doesn't really matter what it is, Peace Corps or working for an NGO overseas. So you might just be uh, helping people learn how to do uh, sustainable agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but that really is a big differentiator, probably would be as significant as a foreign language. I want to add or ask to, you know, not a lot of students have the ability to go into computer science or computer engineering because it's hard to get into at UCSB. But if folks were able to take the time to learn those skills on their own through boot camps <laughs> and community college courses and stuff, would that show up well as well? Yeah, if you learn a programming language, I think it would be just as valuable as learning a foreign human language, right? Like Chinese. So Definitely. For it's good. All you be be arts. very, 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 very a liberal arts person. I mean, I'm a liberal arts guy too. My degrees are all in political science, and but I know quite a bit of tech uh, that I've learned over the years. And that that's very valuable in this line of work. Yeah. A lot that of line of work. A lot of it you can teach yourself um, outside of the university. Um, Someone asked, kind of along the computer science, I don't know if you might know what this means, but will the government prefer, they wrote ABET -A -A accredited computer science degrees or non-ABET computer science degrees? It doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter because all the stuff you're going to need to know to run espionage operations, you're going to get taught in the government. It's just whether you have the basics. So they're really going to look at your grades and where you went to school. Um, so that's a good question, but it, 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 they're really looking for aptitude. Does the person have the aptitude? Are they trainable? Can they get they a clearance? That's the way the government will look. Yes, that's the way the government will look at you. Are you trained? Do you have aptitude? Are you trainable? Can you get a clearance? Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions come through, but I want to make sure what else we can ask here. Um, so someone's asking, is there a specific program? You mentioned grad school is a good stepping stone. Are there specific programs in grad school like Homeland Security or maybe cybersecurity or international affairs? Do those matter or is it just the- Those are all, those are all fine, but I would actually focus more on an issue, a region issue or area. So I would say if you get a, uh, if you pursue something where you're focusing on uh, nuclear weapon game theory and international relations or the politics of the former Soviet republics, right? Or China, and you get a degree where you comparative politics or geography or archeology span or the study of religion, especially if it comes along with a language requirement is gonna be better than national security programs. National security programs, a lot of them are not really very good. They're mostly taught by people who are doing their best, but they're teaching about something they don't, they often never worked at. And the only way to really learn what these fields are like, what these jobs are like is to work in them because even though the CIA is a lot more public information now than there was 25 years ago, you can't really get a sense of what it's like from the outside. So you're not gonna learn that in those programs. So I would say really focusing on a, an issue or a region uh, of interest uh, to the US national security apparatus is probably more valuable than uh, going to a national security program or an intel program. Um. Any common mistakes that you see people try, people making when they try to get into the field? Unhealthy choices. Like, you mean drugs, in their personal alcohol, life. and okay. Shop, shoplifting, um, gun crime, gun crime uh, mishandling a weapon, right? Like you're going to the range and you have your gun and your ammo and your car in the same case unlocked cop stops you you have to tell them and then you have a gun violation right it goes on your record uh but in california that's a violation in other states it wouldn't be so just you know bad bad choices poor choices that's the that's the bit that's the biggest one and then and then the other thing is uh the next thing is uh poor grades 
and um, uh, that's just not going to help you. Poor grades. What? Um, and uh, what? not what? doing it. Not doing it. Uh, the good grades are, you know, above a B, B and above, right? Okay. Um, and and uh, uh, and and uh, not not doing anything to differentiate yourself from the uh, pack, which is all the things we've been talking about: language, STEM, things like that. I know, imagine a lot of these students lived in university housing and residence halls. I worked in housing, a lot of kind of write ups and reports and people doing silly things because they're new in the university, you know, having alcohol before they're 21 or smoking weed or whatever. The police aren't involved. There's no written documentation in the police department, but there's university policies that were broken. Where does, does that show up anywhere? That's yeah, I wouldn't work. worry. I, I wouldn't worry about that. Not to be overly revealing, but I do this uh, to try to provide context. I was a hockey player uh, in high school, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's an unruly sort of folks. I grew up in Philadelphia. It's a sort of a. Uh, it doesn't have some of the um, uh, soft edges and uh, 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 a gentle social culture that California does. Let's just put it that way. So. So I I drank underage. I was arrested for disorderly conduct. We got in a fight with another hockey team at a pizza place, and the cops came and took us all to jail. Our parents had to pick us up. And the, my father actually was the worst than the cops were. But anyway, that all happened to me. I, I got it didn't even come up in my in my clearance. So I'm not encouraging people to be drunk and disorderly. I'm just saying that getting in trouble in the dorms because uh, somebody rad you out for smoke a pot in your room or maybe you're allowed to do that i don't know they don't worry about that that that's fine they're really looking for habitual problems selling drugs uh and 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 integrity problems and you, the use of uh drugs is not in and of itself an integrity problem so i, I won't worry i won't worry about i won't worry about that I watched one of the videos from one of your colleagues about this kind of thing, and I recall them saying, we want people who've lived a normal life and not just these perfect angels to join FBI, CIA, one of these national security agencies. We want people who have have experienced things, and that might be doing that in the residence halls. Or you That's know, an know. awesome video. That guy, is Steve Perrin, the guy, he's a friend of mine, the guy who made that video, he was the director of security for the entire CIA. And that video is very good. He knows he just retired last year. He was the direct, he was the director of security. All the polygraphers, they work for Steve. And uh, in that video, I, I, I cannot recommend that video highly enough. He just basically says, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't be afraid of the polygraph and don't be afraid of the security process. We're looking to root people out who are trying to be deceptive and get into the government to do damage. I'll see if I can link it in the chat while we're, while we're chatting. Yeah, um, okay. great. A couple more questions coming through. Um, does a career as a foreign service, you mentioned foreign service officers and working closely with them while you're in the CIA and they get information. Um, so they work closely with national security agencies or are they completely unrelated? Yeah, I mean, there are key, the State Department guys are key. I mean, I worked undercover in the State Department, right? So, so uh, th th there are close colleagues, they protect our cover. They, they, they really help us a lot. And, and uh, we live and work with them overseas. Some of my best friends from, you know, my 20 years overseas are, are State Department and NSA people. Um, and it's also in and of itself a wonderful career. Uh, I was a consular officer for three tours. Uh, and I actually was a consular officer. Uh, it was my cover, but I was interviewing people trying to get visas and helping people. Uh, get immigrant visas to the United States and visiting Americans in jail and all the stuff consular officers do. I really like that job. I, I think I probably could have done that for a living. Uh, I think I probably could have been happy working in the State Department too. I prefer being an intel officer, but that's a wonderful career. It's a completely different process and it's uh, very hard to get in the State Department. <laughs> um, I think that their numbers are about the same as the agency. It's about one higher, it's about a thousand applicants for every opening. Uh, but don't be daunted by that. Just apply, right? I'm I'm just a regular person. I didn't go to Berkeley or Harvard. I went to a regular school, and my grades were not amazing. They were fine, and I made some mistakes. And 
you know, I, I got in. So, so the, the State Department's a wonderful place to work. And a, a lot of uh, what the job opportunities are in all of these agencies are actually available on the internet. And the descriptions at the State Department and at the CIA website are actually pretty good. The only one that doesn't really give you a lot of insight into what you'll be doing is NSA, because those guys are super squirrely. It's just how it is. <laughs> Um, just, I just want to give a plug that uh, State Department is doing an info session. I believe it's February 1st or 2nd. I'll see if I can put it in the chat. Um, so they want UCSB students, so they're eager to hear from you. Um, and I put the Good. YouTube channel for Spartan Compass. That's how I got the idea to do this workshop today is because I was just enamored by these short <clears throat> videos that just laid it all out so clean and easy. And so I'm sharing that with you. Thanks. Um, Someone asked if a psychology major makes you more competitive candidate for the FBI. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Psychology is good. It's good for the CIA too, because a lot of what I did as a case officer uh, was understanding human behavior. I mean, they teach you a lot of that stuff, but uh, psychology is a, is, a, is a very very good degree. It will make you competitive when you apply. Um, someone asked, and I think we kind of know the answer to this, but would a previous internship with the federal government give an applicant an advantage over others? Sure, especially if it came with a clearance. That's a, if you had a clearance, that's a game changer. Because they save so much time and money if you've already gone through that, right? And then at the five-year mark, you go through it again. But it's is it a little bit easier? To well, they already, well, when you know somebody has a clearance, I mean, they already you, we know a lot about you. Just the fact that you have that clearance, you know, you know a lot about that person. It doesn't mean that they're a fine person, but it does mean that they can keep secret and they're probably trustworthy. Probably trustworthy. I mean, Snowden had a clearance, right, and he wasn't trustworthy. So, um, someone asked, are the requirements similar in terms of background check in all the all the sectors in Homeland Security? My aim is to work for the United States Immigration Citizenship Services. Do you have any advice on how to pave a way into this sector? Yeah, so uh, learn Spanish, uh, be one good one. You don't need a TS clearance to work there. And that is a vitally important part of the national security apparatus. That's an extremely important place to work. Those, the, 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 those guys play a vital role in uh, what we refer to now as securing the homeland. Um, and uh, the path in is a little bit easier. Any kind of law enforcement stuff is good. Any sort of law enforcement internship is good. And then really any foreign language, but especially Spanish, just because of where the United States is located. Thank you. I'm putting in the chat, just because I'm career services and I want to do this, is the um, State Department workshop that's happening on uh, February 1st. Wow, you all are asking some great questions, and we'll we'll keep powering through, and then I'll give you maybe five minutes at the end, Scott, to let students know what you can do for them or how how you can help them too. Um, so that one's done. Do you have any personal experience with the diplomatic security folks over at State? Do you see this as a potentially rewarding career? I have extensive experience working with those guys, so. Uh, we work very closely with them. If we get overseas, if we get threat information, I mean, the, the, the RSO, the regional security officer, the State Department, the DS guy, the uh, or gal, right? The, uh, the DS per diplomatic security person in the embassy is a very good friend of the agency. When there's a walk-in, somebody coming in and volunteering a threat information or terrorist information, the RSO interviews that person and they come immediately to the station to the agency folks. Uh, those, I, I know a lot of those people, we have some of them that work with Spartan Compass. It's a fantastic career. It's a security job. It's a physical security job. It's not an Intel job. Uh, they travel all over the world. They're, they, 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 they're, they're overseas, they work in embassies and they play a very uh, uh, a vital function and it's akin to uh, law enforcement. I keep asking these and thinking one one time you're going to say, gosh, I don't know about that one. And then every time you're like, on <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I'll tell you. But. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Um, 
here's a good question about the forensic side of FBI. Would a biology degree be beneficial for the FBI if you're applying for forensics since you have a lot of experience in biology, chemistry, it can run a DNA analysis? Yeah, I just we just had a discussion about this inside because we get a lot of inquiries like that where we had an, an internal within Spartan Compass talking about this. So any science field is good because it shows aptitude because they're going to teach you how to do all that stuff on the inside. You're not going to learn. You're not really going to learn those techniques and uh, that that approach from the outside. So chemistry is good. Biology is good. Biochemistry is good. Um, and it'll it'll make you. It's what they look for. It's an aptitude that they look for when they're recruiting and hiring. Someone asked, are there internships in the FBI or CIA for the time between your undergraduate study and your graduate study? I don't think so. I think uh, go to the website, but I believe there are two kinds of internships in both organizations. One for undergrad, so you would apply like after your sophomore or after your junior year for the following summer. Um, and then there are graduate internships. You can apply, but you have to be enrolled in a graduate program. That's a great path in because if you get one of those, it comes with a clearance. And then if you don't, if, if, you, if you do a good job, they'll make an offer to you, a full-time offer for when you finish your studies. That's what happened to me. I was a grad fellow. Yeah, I just want to let people know the CIA page, the FBI page, they have a lot of all of this written down for recent graduates, kind of the different steps of what to do, fellowships, all the different programs to get in. The Department of State has it. Um, it's yeah. a little tricky. They're paid. Getting... They're paid, too. Oh. And, it, and like at the time, like I thought it paid a lot. I was a graduate student, so I was living on a graduate student stipend. And I made more in three months in the summer than the whole rest of the year. I mean, you don't get rich working for the government, but I was, you know, my grad stipend was like nothing. So yeah, they they pay those job the grad fellowships pay. Can I ask a question that maybe some of our students aren't quite thinking about, but I want to have them think about is what is it like to have a family when you are in a national security career? Yeah, so I had uh, my my wife when I was recruited. So my wife and I were, were married. We get, we were, we met in college and got married after college, and so we made the decision to go overseas together. We have three kids, and it was challenging. My wife is an academic, at uh, she works at Cal Poly Pomona, but uh, but she worked every place that we went overseas. But it was very challenging. So I was travel. I traveled a lot throughout my entire career. In Pakistan, I was there for six months. Iraq, I was gone for a year. Afghanistan, I was gone for a year. So you miss all that stuff. Um, you, you don't really, you're not, kids are not really home. I mean, they don't become sentient until they're like four. And then uh, at least my kids pretty much lost, it. they didn't really, they lost interest in hanging out with me that much around the time they were 15. So it only leaves a short period of time, and I missed like three or three of those years. I just wasn't there. We we had a Thanksgiving dinner one time, and my son, my oldest son, was telling a story. He was in college at the time. He's uh he's like thirty years old now, but he was in college at the time, and he was telling a story about being a Cub Scout. And I, without thinking, there's like forty people, and I was like, "You were Cub Scout?" Everybody started laughing. Well, it's not. It wasn't really funny for me, right? It was like traumatic for me that my I didn't even know that he was a he had his little car that he built and I wasn't even part of that. I wasn't part of anything. So it's difficult, but it can be made to work. If you are going to have, I always ask, do you envision yourself having a partner? And do you envision yourself then having a more extended family? It's totally workable, but it is challenging. And really it is a two person commitment because your partner, he or she is going to need to be committed to su to supporting that um so that's not to sound negative i do it all again i think we all would but it wasn't it wasn't that easy and then at the again students are really not thinking about this and i'm barely thinking about it the retirement age um our national security 50. folks so 50 so 50 50 with 20 years whichever comes last and then are you expect do you work i mean i know you're working now you're working today but are you 
expected to have another career after that? Like what typically happens with national security? Just like the military, military, they retire at 22 uh, after 20 years as well. I mean, you can. I mean, my pension, I was, I retired as a GS-15, which is uh, not a super great. It's not like, in the, it's like a colonel in the military. It's not, not, not like a general. Uh, so I wasn't senior executive, but I was a uh, senior operations officer. Pension's fine. Um, and if I was living in New Mexico, I could probably live on it. I can't, I couldn't afford to just live on that here. But you, you, if you're 50 years old, you probably want to work for a few more years just because you, you'd be bored. But you do get a pension or you do get lifetime Blue Cross and a lot of other things. So the retirement's pretty good. It's like what a teacher gets. I know this kids are thinking 50. I just turned 40. Like, you know, that seems a million years away. And it's not. <laughs> it comes up real quick. Yeah, I mean, it's worth knowing about that. I mean, they'll take good care of you. The, the compensation part is good. It's not, you're not going to be rich, but you're going to be comfortable. Okay. Um, someone asked, I'm currently a poli sci major. Are there any jobs within this context that can help students get a job straight out of undergrad? Do you have any positions in mind? Or, so is the question, can I apply to the intelligence community out of undergraduate school? That or what I'm perceiving it to mean is something similar where they're, help, you know, maybe working in the same vein, but maybe not to the d degree of working in like, the CIA or the FBI. Like, what's a good entry level career for poli sci that may lead to a national security career? <laughs> Anything that will uh, give you the opportunity to learn about uh, regions of interest to travel and foreign language, anything, nonprofit stuff, organizations that help uh, refugees, immigrants, uh, fine. Yeah, go to teach English in China and uh, maybe learn a little Chinese when you're there, learn about China. It'd be, it'd be great. We got through all our questions. We have a few minutes left and I wanna get some final words from Scott. And also I've, I've put your um, website in the chat, but any, any ways that maybe you wanna help students or they can help you, um, I just want you to- So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's, um, it's really makes me feel good that people are interested in this type of career, even just to talk about it. Um, that job was, just awesome like it was i can't even tell you how great if i was younger i would do the whole thing again i would do it all again I, and i do it for nothing mm. and and i'm not just saying that the people were tremendous the work was fascinating i couldn't wait to get into work in the morning it was it was uh it, i felt good about what i was doing uh my colleagues were just some of the most uh uh, some some of the most wonderful people I've ever met, just in terms of their their work ethic, the way they feel about this country, um, the things that plague this country, the political divisions that we referred to briefly before. You're not even aware of those things when you're in a job like this. You don't even. I, I found out after I retired, you know, that some of my colleagues had these crazy political ideas, uh, which they're entitled to. To me, they're crazy, but we weren't even aware, frankly, because we're too busy keeping the country from being on fire from people on the outside, which is a pretty important job. It turns out it's also pretty interesting. There are many, many things you can do within an organization uh, like the CIA. You can have multiple careers within a 20 year period. Uh, it, it pays well. It's very, it's uh, you, you don't have to worry about um, your company getting bought or uh, you getting, getting, getting fired unless you do something uh, with wrong with money, espionage. Or you mishandle a weapon, all those things can get you fired. But uh, as long as you don't do that and you do your best, it's a pretty forgiving uh, place to work. Um, and, and I cannot uh, sort of recommend it highly, uh, highly enough. Just the mere fact that you're interested in tuning into something like this to find out more, uh, I think is, is, is terrific. If there's anything we can do to help you, just uh, email me or uh, Hit the website with a query and we'll respond to you. Uh, Spartan Compass, none, none of us get paid to do this and we don't charge anything for these services. And really, we're just here to answer questions and try to help people who think they might be interested in careers in national security. I've done a couple of other things since I retired in 2011. And uh, 
they're all fine. Most of them pay more than they work for the government. And uh, it, it's just I can't really take any of it seriously compared to what I did before because uh, it's just not that interesting. I just don't feel the impact or the relevance uh, or the efficacy. Um, and that really is not a criticism of the private sector. It's, it's just uh, um, uh, uh, me, me registering with you what the career felt like. So if there's anything we can do to help you, um, ask us. We'll help you. Happy to. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, Scott has connections all throughout the, na the national security careers, um, people who represent different areas and will do an introduction if you're, if you. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, Spartan Compass is made up of people from, from all the organs in the national security apparatus, so we can usually link somebody up who did what they think they might want to do for a living. Well, Scott, thank you. We had about 18 students here today, um, and we had 16 questions. So I would say those are <laughs> lots of involvement, lots of interest, and I have a feeling you'll be getting some emails from folks. And and students, if you are interested in meeting with me to talk more about this stuff too, um, I'm happy to meet. Of course, Scott knows a lot more about the ins and outs, but I can talk about the career side. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thursday. Is it Thursday? Happy right. Thursday. Yeah. And Scott, I just appreciate you sharing your story. You've Quite welcome. You've lived a, m a number of amazing lives and you're still living yeah. even more. Yes. Yeah. Still alive, Maya. All right. Anyway, it was good talking <laughs> with you all. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.